Hi there, this is Alvin, and welcome to the Kickstart Commerce Podcast, where we share search marketing and domain investing strategies to help grow your business. In today's episode, our guest is Mike Solis, a longtime, part-time domain investor, say that five times fast, and CEO of fintechnames.com. Today, Mike and I discuss how a marketing and finance background during the early days of the internet led Mike to discover the domain industry. Mike also shares a bit about how he uses marketplace data when buying and selling domains in the fintech niche, including blockchain, token, crypto, and many other keywords. We also discuss a bit about the how and why journaling daily auction results, how this has refined his strategy over time to identify undervalued domains. And last but not least, we chat a bit about GoDaddy's substantial price adjustment to close out domains and its impact on the domain industry as well as domain investors personally. So with that, Mike, welcome and thank you for making time to join us today. Thank you for having me, Alvin. Happy to uh, be here. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'm excited about having you on the show. So to kick things off, Mike, briefly share at a high level with our listeners a bit about yourself, who you are, your personal professional background. Sure. Uh, My name is uh, Mike Solis, and I have uh, been in the business world for 25, 30 years, (laughs) almost. And I, believe it or not, have had touches with domain names throughout, which sounds a little crazy. (laughs) Touches. (laughs) Um, so, but I'm basically a marketing guy and, uh, had uh, a bunch of different roles in, uh, business to business marketing, consumer marketing, but have felt the pull of domain names <laughs> throughout. Now, Mike, I guess now kind of walk us through in terms of like your just professional background. Like what do you actually, I guess, have a major in? Did you go to college? Kind of what's yeah. that backstory? So I have a undergraduate, undergraduate degree in finance. And I have an MBA in uh, international business and marketing. Did that a while back. Um, Started in my first job doing purchasing and pricing. So I started in the marketing world. But the interesting thing is that I started at a company that was building the backbone of the internet, which sounds kind of crazy. But um, Ah, so now we're, we're back in what, like the early 90s? This is 1992. 92. That's awesome. So you guys were building the the, uh, backbone of the internet. I know some of the younger listeners like, wait, what? The backbone? (laughs) Internet has a backbone? It's like, what? (laughs) Right. Basically, you know, early 80s, the internet, you know, what was then the internet was kind of a loose collection of universities and government agencies that were, you know, sort of connected through what was then high speed lines, you know, Mm. data line. And so back in the late 80s, the National Science Foundation ran what was then this internet of what what it was you know the the base of the internet kind of as version one of it to what we know today and it was operating at what they call t1 speeds which is 1.5 megabits which, <laughs> you know for listeners listening to this you know <laughs> i don't think we could survive on 1.5 <laughs> megabits. but there was no video there was no World Wide Web then. So, you know, for younger listeners, yeah, there was a time without the web. And those were the days of the... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you hope some... and you hope that nobody called you. That is true. When you, you got online. Off the internet if you were doing the dial-up modems then. <laughs> So, I'm trying, so I'm the, trying to uh, write a, I'm trying to research a paper and you keep calling me, knocking me off. <laughs> goodness. Or exactly. it was like, if you were trying to download something, um, it's like, go grab coffee, go take a shower, get dressed. And probably by the time you got dressed and made it back over, <laughs> eh, it'd be halfway done. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. So around nine, 1990, the government said, uh, you know, let's upgrade this internet of what it was then by a, by a factor of 30. So they put a bid out company, uh, IBM, MCI and University of Michigan. They bid on it, won the bid to upgrade this uh, backbone of the internet. And they formed a company called a and and uh, located it in the New York area. And I just happened to Forrest Gump like be going for my <laughs> graduate uh, degree in, uh, in uh, you know, just north of New York City, you know, just by happenstance, took a job there because uh, it was a good paying part-time initial job in marketing. So I was like, this is my marketing and finance, and it was what I wanted to do. 
So, uh, but like I said, Forrest Gump, like I had no idea what I was getting into that there was beginning as the internet here. I got a business card on my first day <laughs> and it had an email address on it that was a dot net, believe it or not. But uh, the funny thing was when I was, you know, first job, hand out my business cards to people back when people did business cards, people were like, what is this? What is this dot net thing? What is this email address? And so it was always like a conversation starter with people when I would talk to them. I was like, oh, email, what, what, are, you, what are you doing with that? And you know, this was 1992, 1993. So it was really before the mainstream companies, before the AOLs and CompuServe and Prodigy were were the people, were, were the way that you connected to, you know, the internet back then. Right. The, the, that was the old disc, the old like disc the old moments that arrive in the mail, and it's like, ah, yeah, you have mail. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, it was a movie at some point too, right? Right, right. exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I think uh, what was that? I, I want to say on the CDs or something. It was like a pay as you go type situation with the CDs or something like uh, that. It was uh, something like I think it was ten bucks or fifteen bucks a month that you ended up paying. For. Right the service and then you had to worry about if you couldn't connect to a local number you had to dial long distance to go to it so then you had to worry about having you know a running meter of what that might cost you and uh, and god forbid you walk away and forget to uh, uh disconnect <laughs> yeah yeah forget it the, the interesting thing about that you bring up with the discs is that was aol and ultimately the company that first company that i worked for you know, I was working in marketing. My first real job was doing, I was a product manager for internet connectivity for business. So back then businesses would connect to the internet for email, FTP files, things like that. So it was really large businesses that were, that were using that, it then. So, but around the time of that modem noise there before for yeah. AOL, they were having a lot of problems in the 94-ish timeframe where people we're starting to go online like crazy and you'd have to dial long distance. So they really needed to get local numbers everywhere. So they actually came to our company and we helped them establish modem banks across the country so that people would have a local connection, a uh, local call to get to the internet then. And uh, ultimately, AOL liked us so much that they bought the for-profit subsidiary that I was a part of. Wow. Um, and they used us to build out their AOL net, which helped them save money for themselves because they, you, you know, since they were doing a lot of that themselves, they would go to their other vendors and say, hey, I could do this for this amount. You should be able to beat that. So they were able to control their costs. And then, um, you know, the good part was we also had the corporate customers as well. So the corporate customers mm. used the internet during the day and the consumers, the AOLers from back then used to use the network at night. So it was a really efficient use of, uh, you know, the internet, uh, you know, of, of the investment that they made in, in buying my company. So, um, you know, it was just interesting from, you know, starting out there to being part of AOL, which at the time was like the 95 was like the coolest company around, you know, it was like, I guess what Tesla or something like that today, <laughs> something, you know, that's just, that's just a rocket ship, you know, that was going bonkers in a good way. <laughs> right now, now by this time, then by the time AOL had purchased the company. And so that, so that's an interesting thing in terms of AOL was leasing commercial lines for residential use in the evening at night, which is, you know, now you, you kind of think of that you're like, wait, what? That doesn't that it doesn't register today, you know, because so many people it's probably re reversed that we use the internet more on a personal, you know, basis than we do really a commercial basis. That's probably true with Facebook and YouTube and Netflix and exactly all, all these things that, things that didn't exist back then. Exactly. But I guess where I was going was so by that time when AOL when AOL had purchased uh ANS, like mm -hmm. Now, had you had any run ins with domains by that time, or have you know, are you still so, kind of out there on a, on a Forrest Gump trail? Just uh, uh, yep, no, well, so when we were bringing in new clients, corporate clients, you know, part of uh, you know, I was doing some of the marketing to get them, you know, the advertising, things like that, helping out the sales folks, training them, and all of that stuff. When somebody would go for a connection, 
they would be, get assigned a project manager. And part of the project manager's job was to get the domain name for them. Ah. So, and again, this was, you know, 93, 94, 95-ish, 90, you know. So again, I think the first technical web browser that became commercially available, you know, that that was mainstream is probably like Netscape. Yeah, that's what, what I was about to say. I think it was like Netscape. And I can't remember. It's like most mosaic or mozilla there's mozilla there's, yeah a Netscape, couple other ones mozilla. that were smaller back then alta vista I guess, I what was that i don't know if alta vista was oh uh, yeah that was probably you know ask jeeves <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yes <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> there was a lot uh a lot of different ones back then but uh, so you know so in the pre-web days though like domains weren't in you weren't even thinking like i needed to you know a doc like because I kicked myself because I'm like, why didn't I go and register <laughs> all these other names out there? But again, you know, until Netscape came and it kind of became a little bit more mainstream, 95, 96, again, the internet was the AOL, which is like the training wheels that they always said, you know, people right. like the first step was going on to AOL then. So people were in their like walled garden. They weren't going out to other dot coms. It was like you were staying within. So, you know, it was just getting your email and it was, what's the weather? And all, you know, like, so, yeah. So I guess my, where I was, was, you know, just there where I feel like I missed an opportunity there. Right. But. Right. Now, in terms of y'all like doing, so you were like purchasing on the half of your clients, the domain names. So like, I, was it, how was that different than today? Like, obviously today folks know like, okay, hey, if we see a keyword domain that represents our industry, like, you know, they're jumping on it yeah. versus back then, it seems like it would have been more just probably a one-off type situation of, you know, if I had, uh, ABC bodyguards, it's like, okay, well, I'm probably just going to get my matching brand, ABC bodyguards, and yeah. that's that. Yeah, and this was like the, you know, I, I'm making this up, but this is like Coca-Cola was like, oh, we heard that there's this web thing. Uh, maybe we should register Coca-Cola.com and Coke.com. Mm. And it was literally like that. So what they weren't even thinking, let me get. Like soft drink or. Sprite, soft drinks or anything. Or it beverage. Was just, it was really just getting the name for, you know, email. You know? Mm. And then it was, and it was also then for, oh, I guess we need to have, you know, a website. That's gotcha. Right, you know? So like, I guess we need a base, you know, the basic one. So like, if you went back to probably like way back machine and looked at, you know, Coca-Cola.com, I don't, I haven't done this, but look back to like 95, hey. it's probably like the most rudimentary site. Ever that was that was there, but that's what that's what folks were doing back when uh, you know ninety four ninety five around there. So got you. And so then you so AOL then purchases uh, A and S, and then not too long after that, now AOL basically gets traded, or some or another happens to where you wind up at WorldCom. Right. Yeah. So what they did was they traded us over to WorldCom and. WorldCom had bought CompuServe. If you remember those guys, they were right? another dial-up provider. You know, there was a big three. It was AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy back in the early 90s. Um, but so WorldCom had bought CompuServe and they said, you know what? We really just care about the more of the business end and the plumbing. And we want to hold on to that. We don't care about the consumer part. Right. So they treated the consumer part of CompuServe to AOL. AOL said, hey, we brought our costs down and built out our AOL net. We don't need this business part, this plumbing part anymore. We'll trade that to WorldCom. So that's what they did. They kind of traded ah. where AOL became like, got all the consumer stuff and WorldCom took all the business. And back then, you know, and this was, uh, I guess like 97-ish, if if I remember, I think it was around there, 97. Yeah, I was about to say, it was probably like late 90s, somewhere right. in, along in there. Because I remember graduating in like, uh 2002 with a bachelor's and uh, i remember nortel and worldcom uh it was like right there at the crash of everything and oh. i remember thinking prior to the crash like oh yeah i'm gonna go either work at nortel uh nortel or worldcom and that crash happened and it was just like yeah uh audible next play yeah. you know choose something else and so it, I guess it kind of that same thing happened for you because obviously WorldCom was in the news in not such a good way. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, fast forward the story a little bit, right? So it was uh, 
they traded us to, to WorldCom, AOL to WorldCom, and then WorldCom the next year or within a few months merged with MCI, which was the number two telephone company. AT&T was obviously number one. So right. I went from a company that had, you know, 30 people in it <laughs> in 92 to, uh, you know, 75,000. Wow. Basically without, without leaving my desk, it was crazy. As in, you know, <laughs> six, seven years that, you know, part of like this whole behemoth. Um, which, you know, WorldCom was growing like crazy through acquisition. And then, yeah, like you said, things were going okay there until they weren't in, in 2002. <laughs> when um, I got married that year, I come back, first day back from my honeymoon, the, the largest fraud <laughs> ever was uncovered in American uh, business history. Here's your and pink it was, slip. <laughs> it was WorldCom, and I think it was, you know, three or four billion or something. It right. Was, Time was the largest. I think it's not no longer the largest, but that was uh, crazy. Life changing. Go, life changing to go in 10 years. Like I saw so much career wise, you know, in, right. Uh, you know, with the growth of the internet and the web and all of that stuff. And just to, you know, uh, sort of a corporate evolution. And it was like, wow, it went, it went bad and fast. Wow. You know? It's, and so uh, at that moment in time, now, obviously you said, you know, you you come back, you you get married, you go on a honeymoon, you come back and it's kind of like, hey, there's your pink slip because you just kind of <laughs> know, you kind of know it's inevitable at that point. Like you're not much. coming back from this. Yeah, uh, like this is not that, you know, ultimately <laughs> um, you're right about that. And, you know, it was a, it was a change for me uh, where I went, you know, I said, okay, I learned a lot here. Yeah did the, you know, sort of like the business marketing stuff. And I just made a conscious decision to go into more consumer marketing to learn mm. that aspect of it. So I went to, um, you know, another company where I started to do uh, consumer marketing, customer acquisition and, and uh, selling different products. And really that's where um, I ended up getting my next encounter with domain names. So uh. most, <laughs> most of what we did was print marketing for brands, you know, and including some of our, our own, the company that was ultimately part of Time Warner. I became part of Time Warner. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I was doing was it was a division of Time Warner was uh, launching a magazine website. So we did that. And then I was looking at all these other kinds of, you know, then it was like, okay, we did this one web web address, maybe there's some others. And it kind of got me down that rabbit hole that everybody goes down <laughs> that gets interested in domain names. And I said, ah, this is interesting. And at the same time, I think it was business.com was sold for like $300 million. And I, I forget, I think, I think there was, it wasn't just the domain that was sold for 300, I think right. it was part of the business. Business like, as well. The big headline, though, was this name sold for this this amount, and I, you know it got me thinking, "Wow, there's something here. Maybe I missed out on the opportunity back in the ninety, you know, the mid '90s. But there's something here that maybe um, you know maybe I should start dabbling in." And, and uh -huh. I started to then in '07 of you know, but I did made a lot of the same mistakes that I think. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it does you know i didn't buy any trademark names or anything like that but i bought a lot of you know rubbish <laughs> <names>. <laughs> yeah so not great stuff but you know that's that's how you learn and i you know that's that's when i started to uh find some of these you know early uh domain folks you know like the domains i think started around that time right rick's blog was around that time he had a few different iterations i think but going there um you know uh, elliot's blog so you know i started to get involved and in, i don't think domaining was around then or it may have just been starting then as the aggregator gotcha but um you know so there was you know and i'm sort of a research guy too like i you know i was like where can i find out more about this you know and uh you know maybe it was name pros i went to a little bit then too yeah, just I don't remember it all from them, but I just remember that's kind of when it started. That's when I still have a few names left from that era, but not <laughs> not much that's that good. But uh, you know, then 
I, you know, I started to say, okay, you know, there's some learning and researching. I probably only had a hundred names or, you know, maybe 200. Now, had you yeah. sold a domain at that given moment that out of the hundred or so domains? So I guess prior to 2007, like, had you had it crossed your mind, I guess, to sell a name or not? No, sell a name? It, no I just started to see, you know, here and there with, you know, that big sale. And I was like, wow, you know, sales, you know, kind of sucked me in there of saying ah. like, oh. You know, I think I'm a marketing guy. I, you know, I know what clients look for in, you know, names and things like that. Like, hey, maybe I could do this, you know, but, you know, but it seems easier than it is. You do make a lot of mistakes. You know, sort of consistency was the key of learning from the folks that were there before and just try to emulate, just started to reach out to some of the, some of the people. Like, you know, I've had email exchanges with Mike Perkins and, Rick Schwartz and, and Elliot and and then Shane uh, from Domain Chain. So like, you know, reached out to folks and then ultimately I ended up selling. I don't remember when I sold my first name, but I know one of uh, my favorite stories, at least with starting it, was that I ended up selling a domain to uh, the Domain King, to Rick Schwartz. I put, uh, I put, I think it was a lot of, a, of three names into uh, one of his traffic conferences which unfortunately I never made it to, but at least I had some names that were in there and ultimately it sold and Rick was the one who bought it. So, you know, I had to do a whole exchange with him and I was like, wow, you know, I thought that was kind of cool and it definitely helped me think like, okay, you know, if I could sell something to the domain king, that, that maybe- He's like, I'm, you're on the right path. <laughs> maybe I'm on the right path. You know, yeah, so. yeah, because not many people, hey, not many people can, can uh, make that claim that, Hey, the the domain king himself, Rick Schwartz, purchased a domain from me. Um, if, right. if, if anything, it's the opposite of, right. of, of Rick Schwartz probably <laughs> condemning some folks. <laughs> like you hadn't <laughs> been true. reading, you hadn't been listening, you hadn't been doing any. You've been going opposite and contrary to everything I've been living for, posting about. So, <laughs> hey, congratulations, man! Congratulations! And so, like you made that one sell and then where did you go from there from having sold that domain you know to rick like kind of walk us through how you figured out what what your lane was in the domain industry yeah so that was that was 2012 when i sold the name to him it was the latter part of that year and so yeah that definitely helped me think like okay you know i could I could sell some of these names and the carrying costs weren't that much then and i don't even remember what i sold it for with with Rick. I was trying to look for it. I couldn't find it. But um, yeah, so, you know, started then to reach out more to, to talking to people. I uh, went to my first NamesCon in, uh, I think it was 2015. So I think ah. that really helped me as well, just to, um, you know, gain more knowledge, meet real people, get connections. That was really important for me, you know, and that same year, VeriSign had a contest that they put out for the 30th anniversary of .com, of uh, hmm. Symbolics, was the first .com, right, from right. 1985. They had this contest where they were going to choose 15 folks that had just registered names. You know, they were going to pick the top 15, you'd win a prize, and then ultimately they're going to pick one of the 15 to be the big winner. So, um, you know, one of my names was actually chosen to be a finalist. So I was one of the top 15 last second flights.com last second flights.com. That's a three word. It's a three worder. I don't know why I chose that. Something must have <laughs> sold at the time. Something must have sold. Uh, that was like last minute something. And I said, well, right. no, last second. <laughs> Well, that's what I was thinking when you said last second flights. I was like, I'm thinking more like last minute flights or, I mean, that's the, the only one that actually I went to was last minute. So I was like, what? How last second flights? But you wound up, I mean, hey, you registered it, you entered it, and you wound up being a finalist. Finalist, yeah. So I made some money, you know, off of that. You know, I ended up having to do a video to try to all the final 15 to do a video. And then there was like a social aspect and uh, Ultimately, I didn't win, but I was in, you know, the, the, the top few, I think. But I think that was another validation, you know, to, ah. and to me, I think it just felt like, you know what, everyone always felt, uh, people say like, oh, all the good ones are registered. And all right. That. And yeah, many of the good ones are registered. That is true. But I think there's 
always opportunity. And that helped me think that again, back in 15, mm. you know, that you know, the contest itself was you got to register a name, put it out there. That could ultimately be a business. You know, my thought was that this could have been something, uh, you know, I still actually own the name, <laughs> but I always wow. thought that there could be, yeah, I've had, I've had uh, queries on it too, but just nothing that, that was uh, compelling enough. But my thought was that, you know, hey, maybe there'd be a way to build an app or something like that to sell the inventory, like, you know, like a price line is kind of doing mm. uh, or, you know, hotel tonight or whatever it is, you know, where right. you're just selling, selling inventory at the, you know, at the last minute, last second kind of thing. But um, yeah, so that was another, um, you know, interesting part for me in the domain journey. Um, but really, you know, that was around the same year where I felt like I, you know, I wanted to really find a niche or like you just said, like a lane or an opportunity. And I started to do a lot of research to figure out what that could be. A lot of things led me to my background in finance and marketing and some of the technology background. And I ended up looking at the finance area and just mm -hmm. figuring, you know, as apps were being developed, again, this is now five years back, you know, it's hard to remember, like, you know, <laughs> when did apps become a huge thing? And it, right. you know, I think it was then, or it was probably a little bit before then, but like, right. You know, the Ubers and the, you know, all these things have been over the past, you know, four or five years or so that Absolutely. have become like so mainstream to us now, right. That you just you do everything, you know? Yeah. It's like the Groupon. It's like the, that there was that, I guess you'd say, I mean, there's been little moments, critical moments, but you're right. It's like Groupon, Uber, uh, Airbnb, like all these things right. kind of came along right around, around about the same time. Yeah. So, you know, and I was thinking like finance hasn't really been disrupted at all. You know, you, you mm. feel like all these other areas are being, you know, disrupted in a good way. Right. You know, is there something that could happen? Also, you know, uh, crypto started to become more in the right. mainstream than, you know, I forget what Bitcoin was five years ago. It was, you know, I think it was almost going to a thousand and like that was starting to make some rumblings. You know, it was a couple of years later that it really went, you know, sort of uh, crazy up to the 20,000, but it was, you know, that was starting. and. So there was Bitcoin and there was the blockchain that, that was, you know, the underpinnings of Bitcoin. And I started to do a lot of research and went down that kind of, uh, you know, rabbit hole and really thought that there was going to be this great opportunity in financial technology, you know, which fintech is short for financial technology. And so I felt like this was going to be sort of the area that I was going to focus on to come up with names and secure, you know, for companies and products and services that they may have. So I just felt like everyone, you know, we were buying stocks the same way from the 90s. Right. <laughs> Mortgages right. are have been done the same way, paper intensive uh, loans, things like that. This has to be disrupted somehow some way and you know, we're still still going through that now. Mm. But I think I was kind mm. of probably a little early on it. So I've had a lot of renewals on it, but, um, you know, but I've had sales throughout, you know, the years, but, uh, you know, I ended up, I think FD came along at some point and I was able to put together, you know, a marketplace there with, uh, all of the names that I have. So that, you know, my business name is FinTech names. Yeah. How so, did you score that? Man, I noticed that. Um, I was like, FinTech names. How in the world did Mike score yeah, that one? It was back you know, five years ago or so, maybe five, six years ago. Um, so, I, you know, I secured a few of them. I think I have fintechbrands.com and a couple of other ones like that. And I just have it forwarded to the fintech names. Started on Twitter with it. And uh, really what I do, you know, daily is I look at what names have sold um, in that arena. And, mm. uh, you know, I have an old fashioned notebook where I write down all of the sales and, and sometime in the day I, I, I tweet out what has actually sold just as a way for me, I'm just knowing as I go through, you know, sort of drop lists and things like that through uh, my education on domaining and everything, the domaining.com and just knowing what sells. I think right. that's an important thing, you know, reading in DN journal and seeing what sells daily you know, name bio, looking at their list that comes out every day. I think that's an education in and of itself. Mm. And, you know, writing it down 
makes me commit to it and think about it. And, you know, that I kind of end up having more of a feel for my buying of knowing what's selling, right? So I think, you know, it helps me in that way of seeing what sells. And you do this every day? Every day. Wow. Um, now, now, wait, uh, hold on, Mike. So yeah. now do you do, I guess, domain investing full-time or is it part-time? Like what? No, it's part-time. I'm still, I work for a marketing agency in the New York area. So that's my full-time. So you got a full-time job. You have a family as well. You have kids And you still make time to sit down every day to go through the list, to go through what what sold, write it down in your notebook. (laughs) Like that's some dedication. (laughs) Well, I think I go back to uh, one of my favorite baseball players, which is Derek Jeter. And (laughs) he just said, you know, be consistent. You Ah. you don't have to be the hitting the home run kind of guy. You could be getting the singles and doubles, show up every day. You know, I think Shane always talks about doing his list. He's only missed it like once in the last 10 years. You know, I'm just like doing the same, you know, try to stay in that consistent lane. And, yeah. um, you know, hopefully it, it gets you somewhere, you know, at the end of the day that you just hope that you'll get the occasional home run, hopefully. But, yeah. you know, getting those double singles, you know, making sure you're profitable year in and year out, I think, you know, is kind of the key. But yeah, exactly. trying to trying to do it all right. You know, you you, you try your best with whatever you do. Yeah. Well, and I think you make a great point there because most, most domain investors, it's they're the, the consistency that they're in is being inconsistent. (laughs) And so it's like, I am consistently inconsistent. I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm chasing, uh, I call it ambulance chasing to a certain extent. It's like where the siren went off last. Hey, such and such said they sold a name for this. This person sold a name for that. And they're in two totally different industries, which by the way, you might not have experience in either of those industries. So it's kind of like you said, and I look at it, I'm like the beauty of what you're doing with fintech names is that you come from a finance background you come from a marketing background you've melded these two things together at the intersection of domains and you're staying in the lane so you have a marketplace set up you've got this rhythm and yes other things are happening um and while it probably you know you probably do look over time to time and go man i should probably get into that but you you're staying the course and you're saying, no, I'm going to uh, not, you know, Hey, if a grand slam happens, if a home run happens, great. But if I get a single or a double, those are, that's what I, that's what I want to strive for. And so that's, that's, you know, that's the thing that brings about longevity in which that's likely how you've been around since, you know, early 2007 is because you found the lane, you found what you were good at in terms of your experience and then went and applied that to domain names that lens if you will and you've been basically adjusting and refining along the way i take it yeah still still buying names you know uh, you know not that many you know it's harder um especially how many do you buy in a given month um i think i probably have ultimately i have uh, i have under a thousand names so i'm not going for the mass quantity, you know, I'm definitely going for more of the quality stuff, but I have found it increasingly difficult to find drop names. I mean, that's, why is that? I think more people are doing it, I think, but also in the niche that I'm in, there's more eyes on the names that, uh, Mm. that I have looked, that I look to buy. So like, you know, if it's um, one of the auctions, it goes out of control. Oh, if totally. it's closeouts, they're not making it to close out anymore. Uh-huh. Um, so I used to be able to scoop up a lot more. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Of these inventory names. And it's just, uh, you know, and I try to be disciplined. Like I'm not going to chase, you know, really, I'm not going to chase names when they go crazy in the marketplace. So totally. It's easy now, my- to get. To get uh, wrapped up in it, though, you know, like ah, oh. oh, it is, it is, <laughs> it is. Now you mentioned what well, you mentioned an interesting. So the auctions are going just crazy, 
uh, these days. And so, you know, you got to, you definitely have to be focused in your approach of what you're going to get. And, you know, you have to have that proxy bid line of I'm not spending more than this and I'm sticking to my guns. And if it goes past that, oh, well. And so a lot of times for me, it's I throw a bid out there and if it goes past it, that's it. I'm not, I'm not in anymore. Now, just opposed to that, the, the uh, closeout auctions. Now, what's interesting is, so at the time of this recording, uh, it is a Saturday morning on January the 16th. Now, we had some news yesterday that came out about GoDaddy and yeah. their change to the closeout auction pricing. And so, like, what do you make of kind of this change that's coming as of uh, February 1st? Likely by the time this re- recording hits, you know, it'll already be out. But like, what do you make of them changing the the new pricing structure for, uh, you know, domain investors to make it, they, they say, level the playing field for those who have the API and those who don't have the API? Obviously, they're saying, look, we're going to bring this new pricing structure on day one. It'll be $50 on day two. It'll be $40 day three, $30 day, uh, day four, $11. And the last final day, it'll be $5. Uh, like is how do you think that's going to change um, domain investing? And will it change your strategy in terms of, you know, closeouts? Yeah, I think it's, I think there'll be quite a change. Um, <laughs> it's going to change. It changes my thought because most of the time, if I'm in closeouts and I see a name, I'm going to snag it. I won't right. really wait for it to go 11 and 9, 5 or whatever it goes down yeah. to. If I see something that looks good, I'll just take it at the 11. And, you know, so now <laughs> thinking at the 50. Um, you know, your uh, margin of safety goes down a bit there of saying, okay, you know, if it's a great name and somehow it's has already slipped through things at that point. Right. Um, I don't know. Ha- will those big guys with the APIs, are they going to still pay the 50 bucks? Like it seems to me they might just end up paying it anyway and, and right. getting there. Right. Yeah. Or it, it makes me think about will GoDaddy sell enough names to cover this change? Uh, because that means to, you know, so if I'm buying uh, 100 names in a given month where I was buying at the $8 mark, which was like, you know, total cost out for a domain, closeout domain uh, at that last level is like 13 bucks. Well, $13 and 50, that, man, that is a, that's a large little space to cross. Um, and especially knowing when your hold time on some of these domains, if you're not doing outbound, they can take sometimes 18 to 36 months. Uh, right. And so it, it, it seems to me that more names are going to expire. More names are probably going to wind up uh, in the drop somewhere along the way, possibly. Like I said, if the bigger boys with the, the APIs um, or even little people like me, because I have API access as well, but I, when I think about it, I'm like, I'm not paying at $50 or my, yeah. the, the number of domains that I'll purchase using the API now goes down. And then I just start playing my chances, I guess, uh, you know, on the drop of trying to be the first one to get it. Right. Yeah. The hand catching, right. You know, right. like, yeah. Cause to think if, okay, in my head, if I'm like, all right, I'll spend a hundred bucks a month on closeouts. If you just say that, you know, right now you're pretty much limiting yourself to two names. And like yeah. you said, hold time could be long, five years or whatever to sell it, you know, longer, 10 years. And it's 50 bucks plus, you probably have to pay the 10 bucks in renewal right away. Right. So you're in for 60 bucks. And that's, yeah, I mean, compared to eight bucks, nine bucks that you spend on a, on a new newly registered name, or I don't know how many people play the waiting game on the way it currently works to get to right. that five bucks. <laughs> you know, to me, it's usually not worth risking losing it to you know unless it's a real like long tail name right something i think is very specific but like i don't know i guess i don't at this point i'm not even buying that many closeout names Mm. much less than i used to because they're just they're not getting there you know like so by the time they get there in a a given time when i'm looking on a daily basis i i write down ones that i might want to buy too and in a week if there's five that's a lot but like I am just like, and maybe it's just because of blockchain, crypto, 
right uh, financial technology since it's so much uh, more out there now for at least my niche right that you know anything that's got a chain in it is pretty much god <laughs> or a block <laughs> in it is god you know like people are buying everything and the, and the stuff a chain see there, a block a token yeah token yep uh, all of that even you know btc stuff in mm. there because you know there's ticker symbols that they could be right you know right is you know at the time today it's what 37,000 or so for for bitcoin but we already hit 40 right you know there's some projections and it could be you know within a year it could be up to six figures so like there's there's opportunity there and and i saw personally a lot of activity in 17 and 18 when crypto was was having a meteoric rise Mm -hmm. and businesses were starting um and then you know with the crash that happened in um, you know in 19 there was definitely a lot less activity for me in terms of quoting out and closing deals um i've noticed in the past few weeks that there's a lot more activity you know tire tire kickers and but there's a lot more that's going on and i don't know if that probably has to do somewhat with the all-time high of, of bitcoin and right and other coins that it's out there and, and maybe it's the you know some of the people that invested in it are selling it you know even at this rate and they have money and we think you know these digital assets there's some correlation between you know totally think you know crypto going up to all-time highs and domains so then with fintechnames.com obviously so this looks like an fd listing uh yep. or it looks like you're using fd so you basically get a lot of insight in a lot of analytics with who views what names what names are viewed and uh quite probably even more than that now in terms of do you do outbound on any of these names no. Or, or no no okay. no so that you know that's the other thing that i you know besides doing my list every day that i you know, write down what sells for myself, looking at those analytics, like you talked about, like mm. how many visitors I'm getting monthly to the different names, uh, helps me in looking at, you know, some of the trends there, seeing what names I've gotten, um, you know, inquiries on where I've had discussions and that kind of helps me when I'm looking to buy new names, you know, like ah. what, what have I gotten activity on? Um, you know, not just in a weekly basis. I'm looking at it over more of a trend, you know, looking over the year, a year or, you know, six months to a year to see what might be trending and, and just to see because, you know, then occasionally something will pop up when I when I see that is a closeout or, you know, that's coming up for auction or whatever. And like, oh, OK, you know, like maybe I have a little bit more insight than just the average person of saying like, OK, or, or I've sold a name that's similar you know it's always it's always a slippery slope though too right but like if you know if you sold a name that that is somewhat similar you know there might be somebody else or th those folks may come back to you for right. something else you know as well they bought a, a ch something chain name and i have the plural they might want that to make gotcha you know, as an example so then in terms of the names that you have listed today, now, obviously you hit a point that I want to bring back to surface here because in, in true fashion, most domain investors, we are visionaries. Uh, in saying that, we often arrive to, you know, various things early. So markets early, new industries early. Uh, and so often these brands, these products, these services, these ideas, we arrive there early, but early can sometimes mean, you know, we're anywhere from 18 to 24 months early. In, in regards to how that impacts your domain investing strategy, like how many, I guess, how many domains in a given month do you sell is it more like, hey, you're doing a couple of sales per month, or is it more like most of these domains you actually hold a bit longer on the horizon of a, like 18 to, you know, 24 or more months? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I, I, most of what I have, I've held for a while. Mm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I probably only, I'm probably doing, you know, if I do a sale a month, that's a lot. 
Gotcha. So if you're doing like, if you hit like two or three sales, like you, you're really, really doing something. And that's probably though, more so because of the industry, right. you're, you're waiting on the industry to actually catch up to where you're 100%. at. 100%. Got, it. Yeah. Got it. Now, do you hand ranch any, any domains? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, maybe a couple in a given month, if there's, uh, you know, I'm constantly reading you know, everything I can on, and there's a lot to keep up to on blockchain and, uh, you know, digital assets and, and crypto. I mean, there's, there's just a lot. And so there's, you know, there's, I think there's always opportunity. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity going forward. I think we're still in early, early innings with, um, with blockchain and crypto. I mean, but you're, you're still not if you do a, if you're doing a refi of your mortgage, pretty much think it's still paper intensive. I'm sure it's mm. you know the pandemic maybe is you know is uh, helping move things forward. You know probably yeah, yeah. you know a lot a lot more quickly than without it. I think you know finance because it's been a regulated thing. You know when when you're talking you know getting meals delivered or or, or getting a, an Uber, a cab, that's one thing. When you're talking about people's money, you know, investing and, <laughs> and paying bills and all of that stuff, that's that's quite, an, you know, quite another. And there's that big old regulation of, right. uh, that, that's huge that, that's in there. But things are changing. You're seeing millennials and even younger are doing, you know, stock trading, you know, PayPal. Now you could actually buy crypto on PayPal. They do charge a you know a fee on it, but like things are changing. I just saw yesterday Goldman Sachs, and you don't get much more of an older kind of <laughs> you know right uh, you know, stock yeah, leg- legacy like finance company. They are saying that they want to get into digital asset. And this was just yesterday. Like you're seeing the JP Morgans and all these guys saying they want to get into this digital asset space. There's, if those guys are coming and it's kicking and screaming, it's taken them a, a few years. Like, right. There's a lot of opportunity that's still in front of us. And a lot of, um, you know, at least in finance and payments and things like that, that it's, um, I still think it's early, it's early innings on it, but there's a lot more to come. Right. Know? I think the strides are being made here, you know, on, uh, on, uh, you know, trying to help people invest in a better manner, more efficient, you know, on apps, things like that. But I do think, you know, mortgages and, uh, you know, some things like that, you know, even some of the the fraud stuff that continuously still happens on credit cards and things like that. Like if some of that stuff starts moving to the blockchain, it should be more secure. Things should happen faster. You know, if you were trying to set, send money to a different country, it's still so inefficient. Oh, totally. You, know, like you have to go wire money at one of these places. And it's kind of like, you know, it takes time and it's super expensive to do it. There's, you know, ways probably with crypto now helping that is going to really make that stuff happen right. quickly and, you know, less, less costly. And it's, you know, it's sort of, going to be happening it's starting to happen and i still think there's a lot that's that's still to happen on it so i think you know this and so i think a lot of other domain investors probably feel similarly which is why i can't find new inventory Uh, (laughs) easily these days uh, you know it's just you know any crypto words are are going like that too so uh, yeah they they're they're in that uh they're in that four figure range uh at wholesale yeah. Um, um, with ease. And so, you know, now it's interesting you bring up cost. And so knowing that where you sit with fintech names, obviously you're going to be early. And so how do you hedge against the renewal cost of carrying as many domains as you do? Yeah. Um, you know, it's just sales. You know, I don't I don't have any other, um, at least for the domain part, it's sales that fund the renewal costs. So, you know, and for me being a finance guy, like if I'm not maintaining, at least paying for the renewals, then it's it's not a business to me. Right. You, know, like you have to make money. You have to ring that cash register. So, you know, that's why, you know, I do have 
sales every year and I try to maximize those sales. So, you know, I'd love to get Rick Schwartz type money on everything and that doesn't <laughs> always happen. Um, but, you know, the sales that I've made have covered, you know, all the costs, you know, luckily for, you know, all of my years, but, you know, every year starts off clean. Right. Uh, you got to start so, over. It's amnesia. You start over. I'm, I'm waiting for my first sale of 2021. It hasn't happened yet. I have uh, a couple that are moving along. We'll see if it happens. But How was your uh, 2020? Because, you know, most domain investors, COVID hits and everybody's kind of kind of panics or it's deer in the headlight moment for for the industry because we don't know how things are going to shift one way or the other. Obviously, it totally shifts into the favor of the domain investor uh, and industry. And so, you know, many folks had just phenomenal years. I'm talking about well into the six figure years. And so how like how was your 2020 and, you know, kind of what was what was like one of your one or two of your best sales? So 2020 started off good for me. My Q1 was good in January and February. And then, yeah, things sort of really went (laughs) dead for a while during the height of everything. Right. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think for me, my best 2018 was, was uh, my high watermark. Yeah. In 2019 was definitely quite the downer (laughs) uh, from that. And then 2020 was a lot better than 19, but it wasn't, it wasn't my top 18. I didn't, yeah, I didn't see, I know a lot of other folks in the industry saw like record breaking years in 2020 and that I didn't see that. Um, I'm hoping that's going to be 2021 since I've had a couple of things that I've been talking to a few folks and it's been a longer process. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, but I'm now, not that, now is that. that because of industry? Do you think it, 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 that it's more related to industry that you've not necessarily had the year that some of, of the other domain investors uh, have realized? I, I think so. Um, and maybe, you know, yeah, I, I saw a lot of like the dot IO selling and mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, and I'm not in that space. I, yeah, I think for me, it was probably industry. I had a lot of uh, tire kickers, like I call it last year. <laughs> a lot of people coming in with the, you know. Uh, I need $50. Yeah, yeah. There, even a lot that were, you know, starting at 1000 and then we'll go back and forth a little bit. And then, you know, you get the radio silence on it. And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not really looking to give stuff away if I right. think that it has value on it. And I think because my viewpoint is kind of like that for most of uh, the fintech area that we're still so um, we're so at the beginning still that I think, you know, I'm not selling stuff for 500 bucks or a thousand, you know, like right. I'm, I'm waiting on some of them. There, there are some of the inventory names that are just like, yeah, you know, you, you do have to ring the cash register and some of right. them. I still have, I still have some non fintech names too that aren't on that site uh, that i um that i sell i have a dan dan page too where i have uh you know 100 100 some odd names there okay. that kind of don't fit the uh the fintech the financial technology bucket yeah not the fintech bucket so i have stuff there a bunch of names um so what's the and, breakdown? Like, what would you say that breakdown is of fintech names versus non-fintech names? Is that something like a, a 15-85 split to where you have 15% that are non and 80% that are, or 85% that are? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I guess I'd say I'm probably a good, maybe two thirds fintech. Okay. And then I have, um, I actually also have a, uh, started about two, three years ago, I, I have a little cannabis um, uh, marketplace as well yeah. uh, called Canna Naming. And uh, that's another FT site. And I probably have um, 50 to 70 or so uh, brandable names on, in that genre as well. And then everything else is, is pretty much like on Dan. That's kind of like some of my legacy names from years ago, you know, gotcha. that don't fit into either of those buckets. So then you're working three, three different marketplaces in. 
yeah, you now I got after Nick on there too. So throw, okay. throw that in, you know, and get the occasional, you know, fast sale right. that happens overnight that those are always. It's always good night. to see those, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's always like, good to see those emails. You know, something, something good awaits. And then, well, exactly. something good awaits until you open it and you go, oh, shoot, that's not what I wanted to price that for. <laughs> I'm glad it's sold, but ah, I left a lot of meat on the boat. That, that is true. And and some of these names, you know, like even some of the Bitcoin related ones, you know, that I priced, you know, a year ago. Bitcoin was at uh, 10,000, you know, a year ago. And now, you know, 30, 40,000, like, you know, you do have to be fluid yeah. and take all the new information in and see But pricing is a, yeah, is another huge component. Like you talk about, like, try to make sure I am on the cusp of knowing what things sell for, you know, for things that are out there that, uh, that are publicly disclosed. We know that not everything is, right? Right. So it's it's hard sometimes to find similar comps for things, even like chain names, you know, because it's all over the place. I think pricing is is one of the challenging aspects of domaining, right? Of yeah, totally. Knowing totally. where you know where to price names, and you know what what could have been really hot three years ago is not. And similarly, you want it to go the other way, right? So all the right, you know. So a lot of these you know blockchain names, you know, when you see some of these sales come in. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But I, I haven't seen a huge like blockchain name sold, you know, that's been on DN Journal or, or uh, you know, in the past. You'll be the first. <laughs> You'll yeah. be the first. Fingers crossed, you know, there's a couple <laughs> that could be interesting. Like, but again, sometimes the higher price names just take longer to go. Well, they and, do. and some of these guys, because it is, um, you know, a lot of startups in it, they are starting with .io names or dot something else um, or, you know, not the most ideal .com. And I think, you know, and I've seen that, especially on my FD um, marketplace where, you know, I some people actually put their real, you know, email addresses on there. And I see that it's similar to the name that they're inquiring about. So, right. uh, you know, it gives you some good data there, but, you know, you, you just see, and then sometimes I'll get, you know, inquiries and then I start doing like a little search and I see, oh, wow, these guys uh, are now a startup that's been around for two years and they're <laughs> using the same name as mine, but in a different extension or whatever. And now they're, now there's somebody to be reckoned with, which is kind of interesting, right? You know, that it's like you, you set up camp at the beach, <laughs> you know? eight in the morning and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden it's noon before you know, it, and there's all these people around you. And it's kind of like, Oh, I had no idea that, um, you know, it's almost like you could set up Google alerts for some of your names. Yeah. Or maybe I should on some, some of my higher price names. Cause it's like, wow. Okay. I just registered this years ago. And now all of a sudden somebody has got a trademark on it, you know, like it, and that's happened quite a few times to me that I've, that I've noticed. And it's like, okay. There's opportunity, but I don't really want to always go and, uh, yeah. Hey, you want to buy my name? So that's <laughs> how, I, uh, how I go about it. But um, it it is interesting to do the research on stuff that I registered like five years ago. A lot changes. Yeah. And I mean, and you just said it a lot changes. And for you, you have a full time job. You like I said, you you are family man. And so time is really uh, of the essence for you. And so it is one of those critical things that obviously none of us can get back our time. But that being said, even more so for you, you have to make the best with what you have and you have to make it count. And so the the thing that I just find so interesting is while you're early in the fintech names, it, it's it's that it's that that grind that you're doing every day of writing down the sales, keeping a uh, journal. Essentially, you're journaling your way through to a strategy that you can actually look back on the data that you're writing down. And likely if you were to chart it in Excel or something, you start to see the patterns as well as combining it with your uh, just your metrics that you're getting from the different platforms. I mean, that's that's a lot of information to take in. And so, you know, I, I look at that. I'm like, man, you're you're actually being an educated and informed 
uh, domain investor versus what we call the spray and pray type of domestic <laughs> domain investor that is just like, you know what? I saw that they bought that. So I'm going to go and buy all these different names. And I don't know anything about this industry. So I'm going to squirrel. Oh, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to buy that. And we're going to do that. And I'm going to spray and pray. We're going to hope. And hopefully by the time I get back around to renewals, then everything will, you know, will even out. It's like, well, nah, like you're, you're going to lose your shirt uh, to say the least um, doing it that way. Yeah. I think, you know, working for a marketing agency where I do, direct marketing in my real time, you know, my right. full time job where every dollar has to be accounted for in, in acquiring new customers for, mm-hmm. for uh, you know, these, uh, these clients and these brands, I think has instilled that in me that you really need as much data as you can to try to make good decisions. You know, even on like drops, what do I, what do I drop? You know, like if I'm not getting right seeing any inquiries on it and it's hard in this space because i you know because i feel like i have conviction on some of these names that i registered you know years ago it's you know if i don't see activity on it or if i you know something has changed where it seems like it's not you know the industry's not going that way do i do i say goodbye to it you know and and mm-hmm. using that data like you said you now some of it is looking at what's sold and um you know inquiries just using, you know, I think all the data at your disposal. And I think for you know, anybody listening to this, that's, that's what you have to do. That could be your secret sauce is knowing, right. you know, what, what do you have uh, in possession that could help you have an edge, I think right. is, is the key, right? So like, for me, it could be, yeah, looking at this, all of this data and saying, you know, this is what helps me decide what to keep, what not, and ultimately what to price things out. I do have stuff. I buy it now in, in uh, not that much on the FinTech name side, but on all of my other stuff, I pretty much have it buy it now. And on my higher value names, you know, that I definitely feel like it's so fluid out there, especially mm-hmm. in a burgeoning space like this, that, you know, I need, I need to see in order to continuously reprice you know, depending on what happens. So many new players are coming in, so many new startups. We know there's a lot of startups that happened in 2020 because of everything that's happened. And I think this next year is going to be, is going to be similar. There's people are finding a lot of opportunity in, in, you know, the hardships. Right. Um, Right. And it's, you know, it's going to be a tough year in, in a lot of ways, <laughs> many, many ways. Right. <laughs> but I think every year has an opportunity. In. So I think, you know, for me, it's research, keep your eyes open, do your homework, work hard at it, you know, and you have totally. to stay consistent. I couldn't agree, you know, more. And, uh, you know, with this, with this final question, now I got a question for you. I know it's probably going to, you're going to be like, man, where did this question come from? But as soon as I ask this question, you're going to know who put me up to it. Mm. Like, I think it'll Uh-oh. it'll just go off in your mind. You'll go, I know who put you up to this question. And the yeah. question is, what is the story behind Butter and Crackers? Two folks that would have <laughs> told, said something to you about that. Um, so it was my first names con, I think in 2015. And I put <laughs> that name that I had. Buttercrackers in one of the auctions, I think it was, and it got accepted in there. And I was sitting in the back of the room with Domain Shane <laughs> and Mike Seiger. And they call out buttercrackers or whatever. And those two guys would they were they were <laughs> relentless. It didn't sell. And so, like, they were just like, you, that's what you're going to be known as. You're going to be Mr. Buttercracker. <laughs> and don't you know, it? I got home from NamesCon. I had to send, I had a, it was especially Shane that was needling me with it. And I sent him some Buttercrackers in the, uh, from Amazon. <laughs> butter crackers because i remember hearing something along somewhere along the lines and it and it was through domain chain so ds dsad.com um but i was like man what is the story behind butter crackers? well you know and it's funny because like uh, on the uh 
the weekly Zoom. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the social. Like if I go on, yeah, the domain social. So if I go on that, you know, when well, obviously when Siger started it, you know, he'd see who would join <laughs> in. He's always like, I would come in and be like, buttercrackers, buttercrackers. <laughs> and you know, Shane, forget it. Whenever I see him in person or talk to him on the phone or whatever, it's it's my second name. <laughs> I said so, I gotta be named, I gotta be known for something more than buttercracker. So hopefully it'll be fintech names. <laughs> well, and, and here's the deal. So now, now, did you sell the name or did you drop it? I actually still have it. <laughs> I should have reached out to the Ritz people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, well, and look, I hope I wish you best of luck in selling that. And if you do, <laughs> then you, you definitely got to rib both Mike and Shane. I um, will. And I'll, I'll come on your show to, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to let everybody know that it's sold. Exactly. <laughs> well, hey, wrapping up, hey, what would be your advice to someone starting their journey in domain investing? Like where, in your opinion, should they start? I think that being a research guy first, um, that I would research as much as I can, read, you know, what sells, DN Journal, go down that domaining.com feed, listen to podcasts like, uh, like yours and others, you know, probably, you know, I haven't joined it, but Mike Seiger's DN Academy would probably be a great place for folks to start and to invest their time and energy and money into before doing the spray and pray Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But I think, you know, research before you leap, I guess is what I would say. And know really what sells, because I think that's, that's the important part because you could just go down this rabbit hole that costs you a lot of money. And if, if it's just for a learning experience, fine. But if you want this to be a side business or ultimately a full-time job, you just have to put the time and energy into it. And, you know, I think being consistent, like I said before, is important. Showing up every day and, and doing it. Definitely. And last but not least, I mean, is there anything else that you'd like to share with listeners? If anybody's heard anything from this and they're like, man, I really want to, you know, get in contact with Mike, talk to him about this or talk to him about, you know, fintech or buttercrackers. <laughs> um, <laughs> like how, how can they go about contacting you? Yeah. Um, so they could, um, you know, go on the fintechnames.com site and, uh, you know, I'm Mike at fintechnames.com there. Twitter, I'm on I'm on Twitter uh, at fintechnames. And, you know, LinkedIn, always happy to link in with folks there under Mike Solis there. So, you know, look for me there. Happy to uh, chat with anybody, you know, on fintech, crypto, blockchain. There's a lot to learn. So um, would love to uh, chat. Well, with that, we're out of time. So, Mike, man, it's been my pleasure. Thank you again for joining us today and sharing your domain investing experience. Alvin, thank you for having me. It's been awesome. Had a great time. And uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Yeah, certainly. Well, the next time you come to uh, Texas, we, hey, man, barbecue. Barbecue. We, we've got to do uh, either Terry Black style switch, like... I think we'll probably just have to hit all the places, man. I'm happy to do that. I, that's <laughs> one thing I miss. I wish we were going to be at NamesCon, getting together with everybody. And Wow. Exactly, exactly. Well, hey, man, thank you. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to Kickstart Commerce, where we share search marketing and domain name strategies to help grow your business. Please subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbean. Last but not least, please visit kickstartcommerce.com to subscribe to the newsletter sharing tips and tricks about the disciplines of digital strategy. Thanks, and that's all for now. 